Good morning, I am coming to you from 96 South Carolina. We're at the 96 National Historic Site. It's a National Parks service location. We're gonna go inside here, check it out. See all of what this, they have to offer here. Uh, probably do a Junior Ranger program for the little one. All right, let's go make some memories. All right, so 96 National Historic Site of Revolutionary War Landmark. It says 96 at National Historic Sites, a unit of the National Park Service, which preserves lands of national significance. This park features the site of the old town in 96, an important seat of power in the backcountry of South Carolina during colonial times. The park includes some of the most preserved earthworks, the Star Fort and a military mine of the American Revolution. Here you can follow the trails of the Cherokee Indians who first hunted these woods, explored the land where early traders, colonists, and African slaves settled, and visit the scenes of struggles from independence from the Brit Britain during the Revolutionary War. Here's kind of like a map of the area. This area, this thing here, we're definitely going to walk this trail here. I think it's about a one mile trail. All right, and over here it asks, why is it called 96? It says, the origin of 96 unusual numeric name remains a mystery. There are many theories. One is that this was 96 miles from the Cherokee village of Kiwi near present-day Clemson. The first known historical reference to it on a map it was in 1730, created by George Hunter, Surveyor General of South Carolina. Interesting. talking about 96 during the American Revolution. You can see the Savannah, Charleston, Cowpens. It says 96 played a significant role in the struggle for American independence from British rule. It was the site of the first southern land battle of the Revolutionary War. But a lot of people don't know that. The first southern land battle of the Revolutionary War in 1775 and the scene of the longest field siege in 1781. Early in the war, the British focused on conquering the North. However, they turned their gaze to the South after suffering setbacks in New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. And this is talking about the siege in 96. November 1775, months after American and British troops traded musket fire at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts, the first southern land battle of the Revolutionary War was fought here. Later in 1781, the longest field siege of that war, 28 days, took place at 96. After an unsuccessful final assault by the Patriots, American forces withdrew. One month later, the British abandoned 96, laying the, laying the fort and town to ruin. Alright, and those three... Uh signboards that you just saw right over here is the restrooms to the left and then the visitor center is right over here to the right parking lot is directly behind you right here so as soon as you come in you can't miss any of this stuff also here at 96 they've got a very cool museum that's in here it's small it's a tiny museum but it's neat they got a lot of neat artifacts and the ranger here told us that everything that they they either found it here or they or they brought it in from other sites but they also had a few things that were replicas as well Look at these tiny little dice. Look at that. Those are cool. British soldiers rings. Those are found in Camden. Cannonball found in the Star Fort. Wow. There's this guy here. Talking about the American Revolution. Look at this cannon. Check this out. The grasshopper as they call him. That's very cool. Hours away. <laughs> this is really played a big role in the Revolutionary War, for sure. And one of the things what you learned here was law and order, that there wasn't a lot of, it was frontier justice. It was just frontier justice is what was served out here. They didn't have formal courts until later on. Yes, blanket chest. They use this to, with iron hinges and ropes. Blankets and other fabrics were stored in there to keep them dry. Some 
some of the Cherokee that were here. Here's some of the stuff that they traded. Thimbles. Look at these scissors. Handmade scissors. Beads. Pottery shards. Pieces of wine glasses. Chinese import teacup and saucer. These combs. I was talking about the roles that African Americans played here at 96. They were brought to this area because they were expert brick makers, farmers, wagoners, and cattle drivers. Some old plates. Look at this old toothbrush. Bowls, bricks. Handmade brick from jail with animal footprints in them. Well, wow, that's pretty cool. So now we're doing the one mile loop. There's a one mile trail, that's the visitor center right back there. There's this pay, it's paved the whole way. There's a one mile paved trail that takes you to the Star Fort, which is over 250 years old. It's the oldest like earthen uh, structure that's still left from the Revolutionary War. So we're gonna go check that out. And I think it takes us by some sort of house and some other things as well. So let's go check it out. It's kind of what our path looks like here. They say it's a very nice path through the woods. We're also trying to complete the Junior Ranger book because there's a bingo on there where you have to check off the things as you see them. Like you listen for the birds, you can hear the birds chirping. That's one of the things. Deer, butterflies, squirrels, different other animals to see as well. So we're going to take a little stroll down this trail here. So we're walking the trail and we're getting to the part you can kind of see. This looks like it might be the Star Fort. I see a cannon out there. Looks like a rifle tower. But before we get to that, We've got, this looks like this path turns into a boardwalk, which is pretty cool. Let's see what else we find over here. Island Ford Road, a colonial route to the backcountry. These were the roads that were forged by, they sank to the depth that they were because all the people walking on them. The Native Americans, the Cherokee used to walk on them. And then later on, settlers did when they were coming to this area. That's what this is right here. This is the road right here. A portion of it anyway. Not all of it remains today, but look how many people have walked this road to go trade, to go trade furs, go trade for weapons and other tools. And then just the people who came down this road going this way with their, their wagons and were attempting to find freedom, find their own piece of land here in America, in early America. So May 21st, 22nd, 1781, the Patriot Force arrives. I see him coming down the same road where we're at right now. Cool. And they turn this little area into a boardwalk here. But actually, we're walking still on the road. Because if you look down here, you can see where the trench goes down right here. And then the road keeps going in front of us there. We're just up above it on a little boardwalk. Had to be interesting to go for walks. I mean, God, these troops and the Native Americans and the settlers and the troops, they would be baffled by today's technology where we can hop in a car and drive what would take them days to walk you can drive in a matter of merely minutes the first parallel after days of digging an approach tent trench to get to this point a first parallel was established in siege warfare, a series of trenches that face the enemy's defenses are called parallels. The first parallel establishes a secure position from which Green's men could advance. Stand in a revolutionary soldier's footprints. Alright, so this map kind of here is showing the trenches that were dug by the Patriots and Green's army to try and make the attack on Kruger here at Star Fort. And then the village of 96 is up that way. When you look out now onto the actual thing, how the trail that we're walking on curves, it's similar to the trenches here, how they did it. And then the rise in the earth over there, that's the Star Fort, which we're working our way towards. Here's the artillery battery. The grasshopper cannon there to fire into the fort. And then here's the rifle tower. This is what really changed the battle here. Because once they constructed this rifle tower, guys could go up here and be able to shoot down into the fort because before you're always going up trying to run up the hill trying to run up into the fort having the rifle tower that they could shoot down into it and that's a game changer for sure all right so this rifle tower june 13th 1781 
It says a 30 foot tower made of interlocking logs was erected under Kuzakos. He was a Polish uh, guy that was here. He was fighting with the Patriots. It says from the wooden platform, marksmen could aim down into the fort, like I was saying previously. The Loyalists, with the British, responded to the threat by making the walls higher with sandbags. The Loyalists tried unsuccessfully to burn down the tire by firing heated cannonballs. They heated up cannonballs and were aiming them at this tower to try and get the tower to catch fire and burn down. But they built this, this in one day so that they could shoot down inside of the fort. Very interesting. Begun June 9th, 1781, the mine. Original marks of digging tools are still visible on the walls of the mine. This mine you can't get into as the general public here, but this was the entrance point for it. It was here, the mine entry site. You see the sign for it right there. So you're able to dig underground. June 18, 1781, the Forlorn Hope. This was what a lot of people considered a suicide mission. What these guys were, were they were the ones who tried to storm through the trenches to the fort. They would storm through the trenches here to the fort, then they attempted to go over and breach the fort, and they were trying to rip the sandbags down as well, so that there would be an easier path to get inside. Unfortunately, the Forlorn Hope, the Forlorn Hope, they were all lost. They were armed with axes, and they tried to cut through the outer defenses so they could pull down the sandbags and breach the walls. They were quickly pinned in the ditch around the Loyalist earthwork caught in the crossfire. Loyalists then surrounded them. It says of the 50 Patriots who assaulted the Star Fort, 30 were killed or wounded. And you see this, there was a scene very similar to this in the movie Glory, where they just attacked the fort and tried to go up. Very similar type of, if you've seen that, that movie, it's a very similar type of uh, thing where they try to just attack the walls of the fort and get inside and like they said to do it it was kind of a suicide mission but you have to do sometimes people have to be willing to sacrifice on the front lines to so that the rest of the troops can get in and try to get victory unfortunately for them it didn't work out so this was the star fort a lot of people still say it today it was one of the coolest forts ever built like when it came to strategy and stuff so it was the way they built it the shape they built it Sticking out of the sides of it. I'm trying to get it without the shell. Stick sticking out of the side of it, like you can see here. And then all along the outside part, they sharpened tree branches and twigs and stuck those in the ground. They said it was kind of like a modern day uh, barbed wire for the time. So this is talking about 96, the colonial center in a time of change. And this is just a little picture here of what the village looked like. The 96 city or town nearest really big city close to this was Charles. So here's a sign telling you which way to go. Charlestown is straight in front of us. Kiowe, which is also in the Clemson area now, is to the right. So is Augusta. And then Island Ford was back the direction this came from. And then here is historic Whitehall Road. As you can see, it kind of goes down and it curves around some of the trees and whatnot. And you see the little statue of the people here getting ready to make their trek down the road. So it says here, why did the British burn 96? This quiet field that you see in front of you here was once the site of a was the site of a once thriving 1700s town of 96. In 1781, it had about a dozen homes, a courthouse, and a jail. When the tenant Colonel Kruger arrived in 1780, he fortified it against attack. Everything was built up and a stockade built around it. During the siege of 1781, many loyalist families from the back country, fleeing from Green's army, took refuge there. They also would use this area to uh, to resupply food and water to the fort. This is after the Patriots were defeated, Kruger was ordered to burn what was remaining because it was no longer of value to the Loyalists. It was too far from Charleston and too back into the back country, too deep into the back country for it to be of any value to them. So they burned down what remained of the city here. Here's another one of these roads where you can see it's all paved and flat out. And this is the Charleston Road. This would take you down to Charleston eventually. See this post that's right here. It says Southwest Village Corner. See how this grass is a little taller? That was the borders of the original 96 city where the stockade was built around it. They were able to recreate the site, the space there. And this was the Southwest corner of that. And then you're looking back towards Star Fort in that direction. So here, the site that's here, the site that's here with the white post, that was the where the jail was located at here. 
and it said that they didn't have anything but frontier justice out here and that was one of the things that the patriots and the settlers in this area wanted was to be able to have a court system but in 1767 they had about 4,000 regulators who were self-appointed and their duties were to track down bandits punishing immoral women and expelling vagrants Then it says, by the time the courthouse was built, a judge from Charleston came twice a year in April and November. The people who were held in the jail here in April and November, a judge would come from Charleston to hear their cases and decide their innocence or their guilt. And then here is a communication trench, the sign that's here. It's talking about a communication trench. It's basically right here, square in front of me. So that they could communicate back and forth between the fort and the village as well as to people that were on the outskirts coming in. All right, so right here where we're at right now, it says you are standing at the site of the first Southern land battle, of the Revolutionary War. The men fighting here were all Americans. The Loyalists supported the British rule and the Patriots wanted independence from the crown. So it's talking about how in the location of 96, the junction was the junction of several major routes between the interior backcountry and the coast made it a strategic post during the American Revolution. The battle here in 1775 was precipitated by loyalists who seized a shipment of gunpowder intended as a gift of friendship from the new Provincial Congress to the Cherokee Indians. In response to that hostile act, Patriot Major Andrew Williamson mustered up 500 troops at 96 and prepared to meet the enemy. His men built a makeshift fort in this field where we're at right now. It consisted of fence rails, baled hay, and beef hides. And it had an enclosed barn and a couple of outbuildings. And it says on November 19th, 1775, Loyalist commanders Patrick Cunningham and Major Joseph Robinson arrived with 2,000 men. So they were outnumbered 2,000 to 500. Though greatly outnumbered, the Patriots in the fort would not surrender. Several days of fighting followed, leaving several wounded on both sides and one Patriot dead. James Birmingham, who you may have heard of Birmingham, Alabama. James Birmingham was the first Patriot killed in the South in the American Revolution. A Loyalist officer, Captain Looper, also died. Days later, a truce was then arranged. The fort you see now is not an original structure, but a partial reconstruction of that 1781 stockade fort. And that's what's up here on the top of this hill. That we're going to walk up this hill and go see that recreation of that. They always say walking these trails, it's a mile and it takes you about 45 minutes or so. It takes us a lot longer. One, we're filming. Two, we're stopping to read all the signs and video things like this. This guy's shooting over here at the stockade. But three, all these hills that we're climbing. We're used to the flatland of Florida, man. These hikes sometimes are brutal. Absolutely brutal. But they're fun. That's the important part is they're fun. Now that I recaught my breath after hiking up that hill, sort of, <laughs> this is the monument to James Birmingham. The stone honors him. He was the first South Carolinian to lose his life for freedom during the Revolutionary War. Birmingham, who was a member of the Long Canes Militia, received his final wound from a Loyalist musket ball fire. He fought under the command of Major Andrew Williamson at 96 in the first in gate Revolutionary War land engagement that took place in the South. Light Horse Harry. This is Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lee. And then this is Brigadier General Andrew Pickens. It says Light Horse Harry. Lee takes the stockade fort. You're standing in a partial reconstruction of a stockade fort as it appeared in 1781. Archaeologists have identified remnants, which are outlines of the log buildings that existed here. An elevated firing step called a banquette, or banquette, was located at the base. It says Patriot Lieutenant Colonel Light Horse Harry Lee and his Continental Troops arrived here on the west side of 96 to lend support. Accompanying Lee was Brigadier General Andrew Pickens, who was commanding 400 South Carolina militiamen. His initial attempts did not succeed. At noon on June 18th, as part of Green's final assault on the Star Fort, Lee's men attacked here again. This time they easily breached the stockade walls, but their success was short-lived. So here's parts of the stockade that we're at. I'm kind of standing in the middle of it a little bit here. Off, I mean, up against one of the walls. There's one of the buildings. And then over here, right where little one's going, there's a flagpole. That's where the British flag would be raised and 
the American flag if it was under American control. So we all know it's very important to identify in forts during war who's got control of it by placing the flag up at the top. This is talking about the lost town of Cambridge. This is after the revolution when the loyalists abandoned the Star Fort and they destroyed what was left of 96 at that point. In 1785, the state legislature voted to establish a college of Cambridge here. It says it was only in 1806 one resident described the village as being nothing more than a snug hill of 15 to 20 houses and some stores on a hill. The village had seven stores and three taverns. It appears to not be flourishing at all. By 1850, it had almost completely disappeared, and today there's no visible trace of the town remaining. Why did it disappear? Several factors. The judicial seat was moved to Abbeville when the railroads came to the region. Cambridge was not on the main rail line. The closest depot was two miles to the north. So other than coming to visit Star Fort, there was really no reason to come to this area, so Cambridge just disappeared. The rail lines did it, and it's just kind of like how you see Route 66. All the little towns that were along Route 66 have disappeared uh, once the interstate system was built here. So to go from Chicago to Santa Monica it wasn't the same anymore. Why take the slow meandering Route 66, even though in today's day and age so many of us would love to be able to drive the entire thing at that slower pace. The interstates were built for faster transport. Same thing with the trains, and we see that with the trains even today. There's so many little towns that we stop in, in Florida, especially where we're from. We've seen a few in Georgia and a few in South Carolina on our trips where the rail lines don't go there anymore. The Amtrak doesn't go there anymore. So all these little towns have floundered. I mean, there's just, just all the downtowns, everything's closed up. Same kind of thing. Enough of that rant, we're on to our next site. Okay, our final site here on this trail is the Logan Log House. Built by Andrew Logan in the late 1700s, this well-preserved example of a log house was discovered in nearby Greenwood, South Carolina. It's now used for living history. This is what they called a, a beehive oven. And they could cook their stuff in here. And that's where you'd hang up the enemy. Make them talk to you. Tell them what's going on. Yikes. Can't go inside of it. They got it gated off, but you can still get a good look at what this Logan Log House looks like. So this is the other side of that Logan Log House. Still in pretty good shape. Amazingly found this in Greenwood, South Carolina and moved it here. So now we've made it back to the parking lot and back to the visitor center. I will continue to explore. I will continue to explore. And to learn. About the nature and the history. About the nature and the history. That surrounds me. That surrounds me. I will protect. I will protect. Other nat national parks. Other national parks. For generations. For generations. Of other junior rangers. Alright, good job. <laughs> good job. So she got one of the old batches, one of the new badges, these. And then since so she did two extra activities in the booklet, she also got a patch. What do you think? Did you, was it fun? Yeah. Yeah, that was, was pretty cool. It was fun. Real quick, I want to mention too, they had musket ball candy inside the gift shop. It's 93 cents. I mean, come on. We had to get one. They said it tastes like licorice. So that should be pretty good because I like licorice. I'm not sure about those two. And then they also have cartridge candy. You pour it down your muzzle. Cyrus Wakefield's original fruit flavored candy. Not sure about that one, but that was 93 cents too. So I mean, it was $1.99 for both. I mean, why not? When else are we ever going to find cartridge candy and musket ball candy? Never heard of either one. So this might be the only time in our lives we ever have them. We'll have to let you know, maybe in a comment or something down below how it was. But all right, guys, so that's going to wrap up our visit here to the 96 National Historic Site here in 96 South Carolina. We had a really good time here. We didn't know too much about this place prior to our visit, but we feel like we're walking out of here not just because of the Junior Ranger book, but also the movie that they show inside, which is narrated by Trace Adkins. So that's pretty cool. You can actually pick that up on DVD as well. They sell it in the gift shop there. Um, but we also learned a lot by doing the one mile walk too, that takes you through the forest out past Star Fort and to the old uh, recreation of the of the stockade and everything over there. That was pretty cool. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. Leave us a comment down below. Subscribe if you're not subscribed to the channel. We're always doing state parks, national park sites, traveling, trains, all kinds of different stuff. 
we just kind of do whatever. We're primetime travelers. We just have a good time. We hit the road and whatever we come across, we come across kind of like this. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you soon.